coming up on this episode of Crime Family. So Larry shows up and begins living on the campus with this group of students, and nobody else on campus or at the college seemed to really notice that any of this was happening. And once he moves in, the events that would then unravel and the suffering that these students would endure was nightmarish. But what was happening was that Larry was basically playing both sides and was participating with the Mafia in the very scheme that he was supposed to be helping the FBI uncover. It's one thing to have this guy living in your dorm room. So yeah, you're going to listen to him. He's right there. It's another thing to like drop your life and fly across the country for this guy. Like that's totally different and so crazy that he had that kind of power over somebody. According to family and friends, only Santos tried to take his own life before meeting Larry. Since then, Isabella, Yalitza, and Claudia have all attempted suicide. He showed, they showed up at the door, he wouldn't let him in, and my next thing would be like, okay, I'm gonna go to the police, like, I'm not gonna pay you all this money for three years and not do anything about it. That's just ridiculous. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Crime Family. So for those of you tuning in to the, for the first time, or if you're not super familiar with the show, I am your co-host, AJ, and I'm here with Stephanie and Katie. And this week, I'm going to be telling you a pretty crazy case. Um, it's a case so depraved, so strange, and yet it doesn't really have a ton of any mainstream press attention, or at least not the attention that you'd expect for a case that's as crazy as this one. Um, and that's the story of Larry Ray and the cult at Sarah Lawrence College. Are you guys aware of this case at all? Or know anything about it? No, I didn't do too much digging into it because I didn't want to kind of like ruin the story for myself. Um, I do know that it kind of happened within the last 10 years and things just kind of came out super recently. So it always makes it, I don't know, maybe a little bit more interesting when it's recent because when you think of cults you think of like decades ago but this is a recent one so yeah interested to find out more i didn't really look into this case because i kind of wanted to hear it for the first time um but like i but like katie said i did like i know it i know it is a recent case and i like i don't know i don't know a whole lot of on it so i'm interesting to learn about it yeah, so I actually stumbled upon this case randomly online, like back in the spring. I was actually looking at possible cases to cover for the show and stuff, and I actually just saw like a book that was listed on Amazon called Slonim Woods 9. And I read the synopsis of the book, and it completely hooked me in. And then when I dug a little bit deeper into the details about the case that was featured in the book, it was like so crazy and unbelievable to me that, and I couldn't believe that it wasn't like a huge news story that like everyone would know about. Um, like typically a, a case this bizarre would be all over the media, but not this one. Um, so while it wasn't major headlining news, it did get a little bit of attention for the first time back in 2019 when New York Magazine published an online story called The Stolen Kids of Sarah Lawrence by Ezra Marcus and James D. Walsh. So this article is where a majority of the information about this case comes from. Like there are a few podcasts out there um, and some other news articles as well. But the bulk of the information I'll be providing um, in this retelling of the story is from this article, as well as a book that's recently come out, like that same book I saw on Amazon. It's called Slon and Woods 9 by Daniel Barbin Levin. And he was actually involved in the cult um so the book is his story his perspective on it so those are the two main sources that i'm going to be drawing information from as among like a few others so with that being said let's get into it um so sarah lawrence college is a private liberal arts college in yonkers new york 
And back in the fall of 2010, which is when this kind of all starts, there was a student named Talia Ray, and she was just beginning her sophomore year at the school. And she lived on campus at Slonim Woods Number no. 9. And New York Magazine article describes it as a, quote, drab two-story brick dorm in the middle of campus, end quote. Uh, Talia was living in this building with a few of her other college friends. I believe it was an eight-bedroom dorm like house or something i don't know the exact amount but um she was living there with her other college friends and a few of them were daniel claudia santos and isabella and they're like the four major people that are involved in in the story so so throughout their like first year and the summer leading up to this um when the group met talia she had really impressed the group with stories about her father frequently and, you know, she was just telling them so much about him. And I feel like I kind of got the vibe that her group of friends almost felt like they came to know a lot about her father, just based on the stories that she would tell about him. So they never met him, but they kind of felt like they did through her stories, I guess. That's kind of the vibe I got anyway. So just a little backstory about Talia. So she had a difficult upbringing. Her parents had divorced in 2004 when she was 15. And around that time, her mother... Teresa called the police to say that her husband, Larry, which was Talia's father, had hit her. But when the police arrived at the scene, it was Larry and Talia who accused Teresa of actually being the one um, committing the abuse or the child abuse. So Teresa received numerous complaints against her in this regard, and Talia also accused other family members of similar abuse. So at that time, Larry was granted temporary custody of Talia due to these allegations. And then Larry proceeded to set up websites and blog pages that were dedicated to trashing Teresa and her family regarding the child abuse claims. So on these websites, he posted letters that had allegedly been written by Talia to her mother, saying things like, quote, you were the single most dangerous thing to me in my entire life, end quote. So ultimately, the abuse claims against Teresa were determined to be unfounded by law enforcement and nothing ever really came of these allegations. But uh, after an investigation into these claims, it was determined that Larry had manipulated Talia into making these abuse allegations. And during a psychological evaluation of Larry during this process, he was considered impossible to evaluate because of his incredible ability to control and manipulate any situation he was put into. He was deemed, quote, calculating, manipulative, and hostile, according to the forensic examiner. So sometime after all of this, Larry was brought up on charges that were related to the child custody dispute, and he ended up going to prison, and this left Talia with no choice but to end up living in youth shelters. Like, she didn't really have much of a relationship with her mother, obviously, due to all of that stuff that happened with these allegations, and now her, like, adoring father was now behind bars, so she didn't really have anywhere to turn to. And so by by to the fall of 2010, Talia had been really through a lot with all of that and um, had no relationship with her mother or many other members of her family except for her dad who was at that time still in prison um so i'm not really sure like obviously like sarah lawrence is a private liberal arts school so obviously she has money so she was living in youth shelters but it wasn't really out of like like that she didn't have money to find housing it was more just like not to be with her mother but i don't really know i'm a exactly who like paid for her school i'm assuming probably her father since he did have quite a bit of money so i think that's how she kind of ended up at the school because you think you know she's living in youth shelters you know she might not have the means but i think she was fairly fairly well off if she's at the school so in the fall of 2010 Uh, Talia told her college roommates that she was living with the amazing news. Um, She said that her dad was being released from prison and that he was going to come and stay with them for a while because he had nowhere else to go. And I guess, like, the impression I got was, like, the group wasn't really phased by this. Um, Like, now, now from the outside looking in, it seems highly strange that your roommate's father would come out of jail and then crash... In his, daughter's, in his daughter's dorm room with all her college friends. Um, but I suspect that because Talia had told the group so many fascinating stories about her dad and how accomplished he was, like they were kind of either looking forward to having him there or they were just kind of easygoing and went along with it to appease Talia. Because um, it also describes that Talia was kind of like the leader of their group. Like she was the one who organized the housing and like got them this place that they were all staying in. And she was just kind of that sort of outspoken like leader kind of person. So um, I think... They just kind of like followed her lead, like typically in a lot of things. And I guess they just followed 
with this. I would be super sketched out if like my roommate was like, you know, my father's being released from prison. It's going to come stay with us like in a college dorm. I think too, maybe though, because he was in jail because it wasn't something violent. It was it was because of the custody battle. So it wasn't like he hurt anybody or he went out and like robbed a store. It was like he was fighting for his daughter. So it was kind of like, well, he's not a bad guy. Yeah, yeah. And like, I think it's clear early on when she, it's implied that early on during that investigation that he was, you know, highly manipulative. So he kind of had like manipulated Talia into turning against her mother and like, like claiming that she had abused her and all of this stuff that wasn't proven to be true. I don't know the extent of that, but it like seems like she was kind of under his spell for very, from very early on. So even though he went to prison, she was still very much like enamored with him. And yeah, like she probably backed him up on a lot of things and even if they weren't true, you know, he probably kind of convinced her that he wasn't the bad guy here. And so she probably, of course, told her friends all that and they believed her. So, yeah, it doesn't seem that unbelievable if you think about it like that. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's too, it's like it was always painted as if he was the victim in all of it. Like he got put into jail because of this like conspiracy of his ex-wife and all of that stuff. So I guess that's how they were kind of looking at it, too. Yeah, I was thinking like maybe they maybe they did have a like a problem or they didn't want him to stay with them but just be, like you said she was the leader of the pack so maybe they kind of felt like they needed to like listen to her and needed to follow her lead even though they might not have wanted him to stay there they just kind of agreed with him with her anyways like kind of like maybe they were afraid to speak up I'm not sure it just seems really odd that they would be like oh yeah your father can come stay with us it's just weird to me yeah and like I guess it's like just the fact that it's like on campus itself is just weird it's like I mean, like, fine, if he's coming to stay over for a weekend or something, it's going to crash on the couch. But, like, the fact that he's going to move in, like, bring all of his belongings and just move in to this college campus, like, it's just super strange. Did they have to, like, tell, like, the administrators of this of the college that he was going to stay with them? No. Oh. I was going to say, probably, like... not, probably not allowed. No matter who it is, an adult not allowed to, like, chill there. Yeah, like, that's what I mean. Like, if they... If there was some administrative rule or whatever like i feel like they wouldn't be able he wouldn't be able to stay there but the fact that there wasn't one kind of makes sense why he was yeah and i'll get into a little bit about like what the college has to say about all of it later on but yeah obviously no one knew that it was happening um so yeah it's just i don't know it's just super weird this is like a 50 year old man it's just like, I don't know, this is strange. It's like, yeah, we can kind of justify it from, I guess, the student's perspective and, like, obviously Talia's perspective, but, like, I don't know, it's just to me, it's, like, super red flags right from the beginning. So Larry shows up and begins living on the campus with this group of students, and nobody else on campus or at the college seemed to really notice that any of this was happening. And once he moves in, the events that would then unravel and the suffering that these students would endure was nightmarish. So... I'm going to go in a little bit to a little bit of the backstory of Larry himself, just to give you some context of, like, the type of person Larry is. It'll give you a more of an idea of, like, just how powerful or manipulative this man is. So, um, and I think it's important to, like, understanding all of it. So, like I said, Talia had told her friends about all these accomplishments that Larry had. And to say that Larry has an interesting backstory is an understatement. So, the New York article says that Larry sort of, quote, had lived on the blurry edges both professionally and socially for most of his adult life. He hung around politicians, top military officials, restaurateurs, and business owners, end quote. That was just the type of crowd that he found himself in. It just kind of seemed like he was the type of guy that would just always, like, meet these people through no, couldn't really, uh, no inexplainable reason. Like, he just kind of ended up in these situations with these, like, very powerful people. But Larry sort of had a reputation for telling a lot of lies or grossly exaggerating various details of his life. So he would tell over the top stories and he kind of became notorious for these tall tales. But the article describes that the lies that he would tell, like he was kind of clever with it because the lies that he would tell would be mixed with some details of truth. So nobody could really like determine what was actually true and what wasn't. And like there were certain details that people knew were true, like if he had a certain like ranking or had a certain job so like they knew that was true so then it kind of made everything that followed it seem plausible even though some of it might have been exaggerated or completely fabricated so it was just kind of one of those people and i think i don't know i feel like we, a lot of people know that uh, someone in their life that just kind of like tells these tall tales and people are kind of questioning like the legitimacy of the information um 
He was described as a chameleon by people who knew him. He could play up different parts of his personality or exaggerate different details about his life depending on who he was talking to. He was charming and very convincing. And he dabbled in various industries. He worked on Wall Street in the 80s. He had stints in the insurance, finance, construction, and gambling industries. And he knew a lot of people in high places. He was in the Air Force for a very short time in the early 80s. And in the early 90s, he was working with the CIA on top secret missions in Russia and Kosovo, allegedly. The New York Magazine article goes into much more depth about his various connections to Russian and U.S. politicians, actors, and possible members of the mafia. But I won't get into all of those details here, but I'm just going to put a link to the full story in the show notes so that you can read it because it's very fascinating. I think the article in total, it's like 30 pages or something. It's a really long article, but it goes into like so much detail about all these different connections that he had, which is really fascinating. But there's one particular relationship that he had that I think is the most important one that I want to touch on. So this relationship was with a man named Bernie Carrick. And when Larry and Bernie met back in 1995, Bernie was an NYPD police detective. And the two hit it off immediately and became very close. And Larry was a best man at Bernie's wedding only a few years later. So... At one point in time, Larry used his various military and political connections to help Bernie's career advancement. So there was one time um, Larry was able to arrange a meeting between some Russian politician and New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani as a favor to Bernie. And so then Giuliani promoted Bernie to commissioner of the Department of Corrections for NYPD. So like Bernie being in the NYPD worked closely with the mayor and he probably said like larry you know this russian politician can you get him in to meet with the mayor um as a favor to me and then larry would do it and then that kind of helped bernie gain favor like with rudy giuliani and all these other politicians so he kind of worked his way up that way um and then a little bit later on larry got involved in this whole mess he was acting as an FBI informant. Um, He claimed that he had some very important mafia connections and that he could help the FBI and he could bring some information to light that would help them with like an investigation into this undercover operation that was happening. So, but what was happening was that Larry was basically playing both sides and was participating with the mafia in the very scheme that he was supposed to be helping the FBI uncover. So he used his participation in the FBI's sting operation to cover up his own involvement in the scheme. And then when all of that went awry and he got discovered for that, he was brought up on charges that related to this. And at this time, once he got into this whole mess, his good friend Bernie Carrick refused to help him. And now at this time, Bernie was now the police commissioner of the NYPD, which is one of the most powerful positions in the entire NYPD. So he's very high up. And this was all happening in the early 2000s. And uh, Bernie was known on the national stage at this point because He was the top police commissioner in the aftermath of 9-11. So he was making a lot of like television appearances. Obviously, after 9-11, he's like the New York police commissioner. So he's doing interviews about like, you know, the effect of the attacks on the city and stuff like that. So a a lot of people like know who he is. So um, and I I would assume it doesn't really say this, but I'm assuming like he didn't want to help Larry in this position that he was in because, you know, he was in such a good spot professionally and politically and helping Larry, who was now like a disgraced and crooked FBI informant, like would likely be professional suicide for him. So, you know, he kind of like, I feel like Larry probably thought that, oh, now he's too good for me. I helped him get to where he is. And now I need him. He's like wanted Bernie to like, you know, help him in these charges and put in a good word for him with like the district attorney and all of that stuff to try to get him out of this, these charges that he was facing. But then Bernie would refuse to do it. Um, So this was a huge betrayal for Larry and caused their friendship to pretty much end. But um, Larry wasn't done with Bernie. And this is in the article they know. This is kind of where Larry sort of took a bit of a turn. Instead of becoming like the person that he used to be, he became a lot more vengeful, a lot more vindictive, maybe as a result of this. Or maybe he had that in him before, but this kind of set him over the edge. Yeah, so Bernie probably knew that larry was wrong and he did it on purpose and that you know what he did was illegal so why would he stick his neck out for someone that he know that he knew like did that purposely you know what i mean like it's not worth it for him for sure he's not gonna be like a shady cop to help a shady friend so yeah yeah like he you know he knows his friend is just been caught doing this horrible thing he's like facing prison time he's not gonna go out on a limb and say oh i defend him or i'm gonna help get him off like obviously he would probably lose his 
you know, he's going to lose his like top position. So like, why would you do that? But I guess in Larry's eyes, it was like, well, I helped you get to the, that position. So now, you know, now's your time to like have my back kind of. Um, I mean, I'm just, that's like my own like thinking. I don't know if that's for sure what he thought, but I'm assuming that's, he thought like, oh, what's up? You know, I have a friend and like in the NYPD who can help me. Um, but he kind of refused to do yeah, that. Maybe that was his thinking doing all this. He's like, oh, I have someone that can totally like get me out of any situation I get myself into. So it really doesn't matter what I do. He could have been thinking that as well. So, you know, screw him. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, no one I would think would really like, it's not shocking that Bernie wouldn't help Larry out. Obviously, who would? Um, when your friend just did something super shady and like, you know, it was shady. But yeah, so like I said, that kind of caused their friendship to end, but Larry wasn't quite done with Bernie yet. And a few years later, after all of this happened, there was a new story that like broke that actually outlined a series of corruption allegations and like improprieties that actually led to Bernie's own public downfall and a three-year stint in prison. So Bernie had his own stuff. He was like having affairs. He did a bunch of illegal things like financially. So he was a corrupt cop basically so he wasn't like this stellar guy that i think he was presenting himself as but larry was the major source in that news article that like exposed all of this so it was fairly obvious that i think larry was doing it out of revenge he's like well you didn't help me with these charges and now i'm gonna like rat you out for all this stuff and then when they did an investigation bernie ended up being in jail for three years himself so oh okay so i guess he he wasn't as like straight edge as i was thinking but also, having an affair isn't Ill- isn't illegal either. I hate when everyone's like, "Oh, he had an affair," and like they drag that in. It's not, that's not illegal. Like I think he was kind of put up on a pedestal after nine eleven. Like he was kind of seen like he's the police commissioner. He's like helping the people, like you know, in the healing after nine eleven. So like he was kind of like seen in a positive light. So I think like the fact that he's having an affair and he's doing all of this stuff like just shows that he wasn't like didn't live up to the image that I think was projected of him. Um, but yeah, it's fairly obvious that I think Larry just did that out of. He was vindictive about it. He was just trying to do it to get back at Bernie for not having his back. So this is why a couple of years after when Larry and Teresa, like his ex-wife Teresa, were in the midst of, you know, those abuse allegations and that child custody hearing and stuff that I told you about before, Larry was convinced that Bernie Carrick had teamed up with Teresa and Rudy Giuliani to use the family court against him. So he says that Bernie was out for revenge due to Larry's role in his public downfall and all of that stuff. But then other times he also... He mixed that with other allegations, and he says that it was actually Bernie who was in cahoots with President George W. Bush, Vice President Dick Cheney, and Rudy Giuliani, who were trying to silence him because of apparent knowledge that he had about the 9-11 attacks that they didn't want to get out. So that's what he says, this whole thing. So everything that comes up in this article all links back to Bernie. He thinks it's a huge conspiracy. Bernie's like out to get him after, you know, Larry did that thing to him. Or everything always comes back to this big conspiracy that they're out to get me. I know stuff about 9-11 that they're trying to keep secrets. So crazy. So now, you know, I have a little bit of an idea of who Larry is and a little bit of what his past is. And like I said, the article goes into much more detail about all of that. So if you're intrigued and you want to know even more because i just kind of scratched the surface with all of that there's like russian politicians and like people overseas and this mafia people like it's this is really crazy so um obviously i couldn't i didn't have time to get into all of that here but i just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background on the kind of person that larry is so was he actually involved with all these groups and people or was it just kind of him being like you know this is how important i am and that kind of thing but i don't know like obviously he did like it was it was true like in the article it actually says that he even had connections like he set up a meeting between some politician and actor robert de niro and he was able to like get them it was like weird so he does know these people somehow um but like i said he did kind of have he did tell tall tales and like exaggerated so that's the thing it's like nobody really knows what part of it is true what part of it isn't obviously like he that whole investigation like he was an fbi informant so that stuff is all true and he did work for the cia and Russia and Kosovo and all that stuff and apparently he had a huge role in like you know helping with like peace relations overseas in Kosovo and stuff so like it's kind of like all muddied so, like nobody really knows what's true what isn't so did he just come like super paranoid after like with all those allegations with Rudy Giuliani and all those people like he's completely paranoid about all that stuff like I don't know like I think but like I said the article describes like it was after um 
Bernie like wouldn't help him that's when he like took a turn and he became very much more vindictive and stuff so I don't really know if he like believed the stuff that he was saying about like oh I know stuff about the 9-11 attacks like I don't know if he actually believed that but he was just saying that like that was his excuse for any time anything would go wrong it's like oh well it's just a conspiracy they're out to get me I didn't do anything wrong I'm a victim here and everything Hmm. Um, interesting so yeah I don't really know but yes like I said the article is fascinating so definitely go read it we'll put a link in the show notes because it's crazy but now let's get to what he did in this particular case so like I said now flash forward back to 2010 Larry just showed up on the doorstep of Salon and Woods number 9 moving in with his daughter's college roommates so on the surface I guess things seem to be fine like I guess if anyone would kind of come over to the apartment or something they might not think anything's out of the ordinary besides you know this 50 year old man living with them but other than that um, there's one roommate, Juliana, who says that he took on like a fatherly role within the home. He would clean up for them a lot. He would, you know, make make dinner for them. He would host like, you know, family like movie nights and all this kind of stuff. Um, and he would engage in like deep conversations with them about truth and justice and the nature of the universe and like all of this kind of deep philosophical sort of stuff. Um so it's clear that the students were kind of enamored by him the same way that his daughter Talia was. Like, they all kind of seemed to fall under his spell as well. So they saw him as his father figure with so much life experience and as someone who could potentially help them with any internal struggles that they were facing. Or at least that's how he presented himself as. He kind of as like this guru. Um, so at this time, all of these like students who were living there, they were all kind of searching for guidance. So, um, and this was guidance that Larry claimed to be able to provide. So for example, Daniel was struggling with his sexuality and he was like seeking help from Larry to sort of sort this out. Um, and Larry insisted that Daniel was not gay and that he could help Daniel through this. And he had various reasons and insights as to why that was the case. And then there's two other roommates, Claudia and Santos, who were both struggling with depression at this time. And, and, and then Isabella, another person, suffered a difficult breakup just after Larry arrived. And she was like seeking advice on guidance on navigating this. So clearly, they're all very fragile kids. They're all in their early 20s. You know, these are very formative years and obviously a critical time period, I think, in the development of someone's social, personal identity in many ways. Like, you know, you're kind of like finding yourself and you're like, coming into your own or whatever like so um i think larry knew this and exploited it to his own benefit for his own nefarious means so although not being a therapist he began holding group therapy sessions with all members of the household and began counseling isabella during this time right after her breakup and just like crazy things so he actually like started to diagnose the kids saying that they had these mental health issues so he was he actually said that they had borderline personality disorder and he said that he was a counselor he could help them they didn't need to seek professional help like he could help them sort through these issues um for example like in a therapy session that they had one night and these therapy sessions were like long they were like hours and hours he would put somebody like in the hot seat quote unquote and like just grill them and like in front of everyone else in the house and like try to like, extract this information from them um so, for example, in one of these therapy sessions, so Larry had convinced Daniel that the reasons he played the ukulele was because of trauma that his father inflicted on him as a child. And then he, like, forced Daniel to, like, like step on the ukulele and, like, smash it to, like, be cathartic and release all of these, like, underlying feelings that he had that were, like, built up due to this trauma that his father had inflicted. So, just, like, crazy stuff that he's not a professional. Like, he doesn't know how to, like, deal with any of this. He's just... He's just telling these kids all of these things. And um, so, like, Larry would force these totally false confessions from these kids, like, extracting revelations and secrets out of them uh, so, he could, so he could use it against them later. And many of the students actually claimed that most of these revelations were totally fabricated. He, they were just made up in the moment to please Larry because he kind of came... Everyone kind of knew that you never wanted to make Larry mad. He was very vindictive and he would like embarrass you and humiliate you if you ever like did anything to make him mad. So like just to kind of like satisfy him, they would just tell him what he wanted to hear. So like also in the book that I read, Daniel says like he made up the story about like when he was a child, he saw like a a bird that was like struggling to live like on in his yard he picked it up and then crushed it with his bare hands but then that was like all of made up story but i guess it was just larry got that out of him i don't know it's super weird i don't really know like how that happens but that's what so was happening they knew from like from very early on that larry was just this guy that they couldn't really trust but yet 
they didn't really want to disappoint him, so they just made up these stories just to like appease him, I guess. Well, I don't know. I don't think it's that they. I don't think it's that they didn't trust him. I think they all trusted him. Like they didn't really know all of that stuff about his past. Like they were only hearing what Talia had sort of said and what he would tell them. So like Talia is telling all these great stories. Like oh he he's an FBI informant. He worked for the CIA. Like he knows all these high like professional people. And he was went to jail. It was all a conspiracy. Like there's people out to get him. So to them they don't know that he's like they're just they're obviously very impressionable and he kind of helped them and gave them guidance at a time when maybe they didn't have it from anywhere else so they just bought into it it's just so crazy to me like i feel like maybe they i mean yes they had like problems and they wanted they need somebody to talk to but i feel like he kind of took it to like the extreme and like super quickly i don't it's, it doesn't really kind of i don't know i can't really wrap my head around it like the whole thing like it's crazy to me and maybe if you read the um article like because it's so long it's like 30 pages like it might be more of like a natural progression but i'm just trying to give you like the basic facts so it might seem like a little bit like what extreme to the other or like crazy that but obviously he's a very manipulative guy like he was able to like like forge these relationships with all these powerful people even though he didn't really have any like discernible like i said he worked in wall street on the, in the 80s he didn't have a degree or any training in wall street he ended up working on wall street like that how does that happen like you have to be a certain type of like manipulative person or like know the right I don't know he just seems to be able to get into these situations and just like thrive even though he has no qualifications for anything kind of like the wolf of wall street basically yeah well he just yeah and I think he was just used to kind of getting what he wanted and he knew that he knew he was manipulative he knew what he wanted he knew how to get it and he knew that people would follow him that is real that's a pretty good skill to have to manipulate powerful Mm -hmm. people like that it's crazy. It, it reminds me of you say Wolf of Wall Street. It also reminds me of Catch Me If You Can, like that mm. movie. And that's true too. And this guy was able to like get himself into all these situations. Mm-hmm. Like, I for, I kind of forget, but like, yeah, I don't know. Just it's crazy that people can have that kind of personality and super smart to be able to get themselves into these kinds of things. Yeah, and actually, it's funny that you mentioned Catch Me If You Can because again, in the article, they go into more detail. Like he was a fugitive at one point; like he was on the run. There was a warrant out for his arrest for all this stuff, so he was like a fugitive at one point as well. So like, he was that guy. He was that guy, Wolf of Wall Street, like or or Catch Me If You Can. Like, he's the epitome of that. Like, but a lot of times, like that's what I've always struggled with, like studying this case and stuff. Like, I don't know if. I'm like, is he aware of just how manipul? I mean, he must be, obviously. But I'm like, or is he just like being himself, and it just so happens that he knows how to do that? You know what I mean? Like, is it a conscious thing? That's what I was always kind of thinking. Yeah, it, well, it seems like when he's with these kids, it's kind of like he starts off slow, like he's kind of grooming them, and once he realizes, oh, oh I can like make them do and say things, you know. That I, like what I want them to do so it's kind of like slow and then maybe he kind of realizes how much power that he can have over these people and that's how it progresses I feel like you see this a lot with cults it's like everything starts out like really nice and slow and everybody's like a big happy group and then slowly things turn but you're too far in at that point which is kind of like what it seems to be happening here yeah and in the in the book actually Daniel describes like the first sit down meeting that he had with Larry like shortly after he meets him like they go to this coffee shop and he says it's like a six hour or something long conversation where they're just sitting in this coffee shop talking and he's telling Larry about all these problems and all this stuff that's going on in his life and it seems like over the course of that six hours is when he really hooked him in and from there it was like you know like there was no getting out at that point Um, and like six uh, it could have obviously was like more long term than that but like in the book when he's describing that meeting like it seems very much like that's kind of when he the turn or the switch happened for daniel at least and and it kind of seems like in this situation and also i'm thinking of other cults like nexium um they kind of like plant these things in your mind like something's not actually wrong but like the way you're doing something or the way you're saying things that's the problem and so it's like you kind of start to doubt yourself and it's all because of what this person is planting when really there isn't a problem but they make you believe there is and this is the only person that can help you fix it yeah, and there's like, um, and there's also a lot of talk. They like quotes, like they say, there you can help them achieve clarity. Like I feel like that's a red flag phrase. If any other, if any like self help group says we can help you achieve clarity, cult, cult, cult. Like the Nexium does that a lot too. Like they're gonna help them sort out their issues and be a better version of themselves or something. So that was very much like a part of this as well, because that term came up a lot. 
did Talia like find just randomly find these group of friends? Like, or did were they like kind of friends with her? Did she make these friends, or did they make friends with her at at the beginning? Because I'm wondering if she like kind of set out to be like, oh, I'm looking like in her mind, I'm looking for these certain people that her father could like that they could bring into like this cult. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um... Like obviously, because this was in their their sophomore year, so they were going into their second year. So in their first year, that is when they met her, and I don't really know like what Talia's intentions were. Like I don't know if she purposely scouted these people. I actually never really thought of that. So that's a good like question, but I don't really know like what Talia's in, true intentions were. So yeah, like it was totally messed up, and all of these kids were. Like I said, very vulnerable and obviously very susceptible to whatever Larry was selling. And yeah, so eventually, um, as things progress, Larry would end up sleeping in Isabella's room and claim that he was only sleeping on the floor and he was just in there to support and to help her because she was going through that really tough breakup and everything like that. Um, and something wild that happened. So this is like the first red flag for any of like their parents i would assume so something wild that happened was that the day before so he was there for like the full semester and then the day before isabella was scheduled to return home for winter break larry calls up her family with major allegations he says that isabella has been had been sexually assaulted by a family friend as a child and for that reason he did not deem it safe for her to return home because it was a risk that she would commit suicide so as a result isabella ended up staying with larry for the winter break but not on campus. She didn't live in campus or in on campus housing at that time. They went to an apartment on 93rd Street in Manhattan, which was owned by a friend of Larry's. So like imagine her parents. Like they get a call from this random guy. Like they don't know who this person is. And he's saying, Oh yeah, like she was molested as a child. She's not coming home because she's gonna kill herself if she comes home. So you're not gonna allow her to come home. Like, what? <laughs> like how did they not call the police right then and there? Yeah, I was going to say, what did they do about that? They're just like, okay, then. All right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And, like, the article doesn't go into a ton of detail about, like, what the parents' next move was. I would assume they, like, didn't just say, oh, okay. Like, I'm assuming they, like, tried to do something. But it doesn't really go into much detail about that, or at least not in that article or something. So, but I'm assuming they were trying things behind the scenes. But nothing that really came of it initially. Like, my first thing would be, like, if my daughter said she wasn't coming home, some random man called me and say that she wasn't coming home i'll be like first of all who are you second of all i'm gonna be calling the cops because like i don't know who this person is who said yeah. the daughter's not and they and, didn't do anything and, about it that just seemed weird to me well i mean i guess I, they probably were behind the scenes but like no nothing ever happened like no charges were ever pressed against him at this time or he wasn't removed from campus or something i don't know but obviously that would have been very bizarre yeah, and also, as the parents, I would have been like, okay, well, maybe she's not coming home, but she's not living with you. Like, I'm going to find her somewhere else to live. Like, you're not in the picture. <laughs> yeah, like, who are you? <laughs> yeah, like, so, yeah, like, so bizarre. So, anyway, Is- Isabella ends up staying for li- with Larry over the winter break, and they moved to Manhattan. So, like, the school was located in Yonkers, which I don't think is far from Manhattan. Like, I think it's a train ride away. So, they, um lived on 93rd street in manhattan and the apartment was owned by a friend of larry's named lee chen who has an interesting role in all of this as well um and at the time so talia's boyfriend so talia had a boyfriend at the time and he was kind of like in the apartment a lot um kind of in and out of there but he claims that every single aspect of the students lives was controlled by this man in that apartment so what they ate where they went what they did who they talked to, et cetera, et cetera. Like they couldn't do anything without running it by Larry first. Um, and then after the winter break, they all went back to Slonim Woods number nine and they lived in that same apartment again. And things went back to the way they were before. They had another semester with these random group counseling sessions, bizarre behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So in the book, he describes Larry helping him at this time in his life and basically encouraging. So he tells so what's interesting about the book so like when i read the book i was like oh i need like more information about this case but the book is written from his perspective so a lot of this other stuff that i've told you about all of larry's history and all of the stuff that happened with isabella none of that's in the book because it's only what daniel knows like it's going in real time from what he knows at the moment so in the book like if you don't know all that other stuff like you're just getting it from what he's thinking or what his perspective is um which a lot of it like he's kind of in it right so he's kind of can he hear his like he tells you about his hesitation and stuff but um you're not seeing like the bigger picture 
sort of thing. But he says that, you know, at this time in his life, Larry was helping him and says that he was encouraging and almost forcing Isabella to sleep with Daniel as a way so that, to help Daniel. Um, there's, account, there's an account in the book about Daniel, Isabella, and Larry like having a sexual experience together one night. It's like s- super weird. And Larry kept saying it was a way to help them and they could achieve clarity. And it was like, would free them up to like their true authentic selves. So like super sketch. So everything Larry did in the apartment was under the guise of helping them. And from the beginning, everyone believed the actions were for their benefit. So um, Daniel also says in the book that his father called him with concerns early on that he was in a cult due to his strange behavior. And he was distancing every from like his family members and from his friends. So um, they were all kind of... He was distancing from everyone, but Daniel kind of brushed off his his father's concerns as nothing more than just ill-advised parental advice. Um, and there was actually a po- moment in time where, like, Daniel and Claudia even left the country. They went to do a semester abroad, and Larry was still controlling them throughout this time. So I think this would have been in, like, their, their um, junior year. They went to England, and they did a semester abroad. And, like, during this time that they were away, he would force them to have group Skype sessions where Daniel and Claudia would, like, have sex over Skype, and Larry would watch. It was, like, so weird. So even outside of the apartment, like, they're super... In, in it already so even outside the apartment when he's not having watch over them he's still like controlling their every move in a way so it's totally messed up kind of going back to something I think it was Steph said earlier like about how everyone kind of was like hesitant or like might have been hesitant so one interesting thing that Daniel says is he initially did question all of it but his observation was that everyone else seemed to be fine with it so he thought that his reluctance was like something wrong with him so he decided to go along with it like i think a lot of times too like in the nexium called when you know all the documentaries that came out with that one it was like they were taught very early on that like being hesitant was like a reflection of your own issues like they were kind of trained to like if they had a hesitancy that like it wasn't a bad thing they had to like get over it and just go with it which is obviously a way to like manipulate you and like condition you in order to like agree to things that you would normally do um so he says that like every time that he would kind of come up with one of these hesitancies it would be like oh well this must be something that i'm dealing with that i need to deal like i need to deal with this get over it and um and so when you think about it like individually they may have all have had these questions but nobody was really vocalizing it out loud like Larry was kind of in the apartment at all times. So there was never like a moment where any of them could just like sit down and talk without him there or like have conversations away from him really. And if they were away from him, like they never really, it never really got brought up. So like they all could have individually been thinking this, but then like when they were like, well, no one else is thinking this. So like, it must be about me. So, but then it's like, if you just think like, all it takes is like, you know, in the movies when you're like, all it takes is one conversation and this whole mess would be resolved. It's kind of like that where it's like, if they just could sit down and all have a conversation and they could all express maybe their own hesitancies, it could have been solved much earlier. Because obviously Daniel was having those thoughts as well. Um, But he just thought that everyone else was super into it. So he's like, well, it must be my, my issue. And he's like, you should think it like, well, obviously Larry's not terrible because then everyone else would have an issue with it. So if everyone else is fine, then. Like but it must be fine. Didn't didn't they like didn't they not go to school? Like did they go to classes or anything? Like, I feel like they could like meet somewhere like at lunchtime or Yeah, well they went to class and stuff, but like I don't know if they were all weren't in the same classes. I don't know. Like it just obviously they weren't having conversations about this or Daniel was like afraid to express it to anyone else. Because like I said, he's seeing everyone else into it, so he thinks like, oh well maybe if I do it mentioned it to someone then like they're gonna tell him and then it's gonna get worse and then i'm gonna be punished so yeah like that's the way that he had the that's the way that he had them all manipulated right like to not do that and not do anything against him and not to question him at least out loud so claudia did try and raise alarm bells early on so she right before daniel and claudia left for that semester abroad she actually sent an email to the sarah lawrence college dean what was going on and the email was titled the truth after spending more time with larry she backtracked that and claimed that her initial statements in that email were caused by larry's ex-wife that was tricking her into making these allegations so again it all came back to his ex-wife oh it's a conspiracy like she forced me to write that email and forced me to say that and then she like retracted it all so i don't really know if like you still think the dean would be like super sketched out but obviously yeah, I was gonna say, he did, nothing came of that. Like, he didn't, like, check it out for his, like... 
I don't know. Is that I, to mind? I feel like... Again, it doesn't go into that detail right at that time, so I don't know what was done. But nothing enough that ever made anything change. So, like, it seems like even when they were raising these concerns, it was all for naught. Because Larry knew how to get to them and make them either retract those statements, regret anything, or, like, forget their initial hesitancies. So, one major event from the book. Okay, this is, like, super sketched out. And this, I'm not going to go into, like, a ton of detail because it's, like, disturbing and gross. But I'm going to just go a little bit. Like, just give you, like, the level of, like, disgustingness that would happen. So, one major event from the book that's also described in this article takes place... When Daniel was accused by Larry of sabotaging Talia's application to get into law school. So she didn't get into law school. She didn't submit the application. And apparently it was all Daniel's fault. And he refused to take the blame for it. And after this, Larry made a garrote out of like he took aluminum foil and he like rolled them up into these balls. And he would place these aluminum balls into this rolled up piece of saran wrap. And he made like this circular device. Um, He ordered Daniel to place that around his testicles. And then Larry proceeded to twist it, like obviously causing excruciating pain. But Daniel describes in the book that he may have, he actually had become like immune to pain in all of the years like leading up to this because there had been other times where he had been like, he would be physically abused by Larry and like he kind of just became numb to the pain. So like he actually says that obviously it would be excruciating, but in this moment he actually faked how much it hurt. So that's just that Larry, he could please Larry and like satisfy him. Like once he reached a certain level of like knowing that it hurt bad enough, then Larry would stop. Like he had to reach that level. Like it's disgusting. And that's only like one of the things, like I said, I'm not going to go into all the other details and all the other stuff. So this is like shows you the lengths that Larry was going to go to to maintain absolute control over his victims. Um, After this specific incident, Daniel, well, after this incident, Larry kind of comes to them, him and says, kicks Daniel out of the apartment, basically. So Daniel leaves the apartment and stops taking phone calls or having any communication with any member of the cult. And he describes this incident um, and the process of leaving in 2013 in his book that I read. So that was kind of his final straw. So how could it not be (laughs) honestly but um so that's when daniel kind of pieced out so So, they kicked him how he just didn't leave why did he well he well it's shortly after that incident he kind of he kicks all the students out at one point larry is like comes to them and he says like you can't live with us anymore you're not appreciative you're not accepting my help blah 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 and he kind of like gets frustrated and kicks them all out um and then daniel left and then like he went back to living on campus because this was happening at actually they had moved off by this time they were living in new york city like in one of his apartments that he owned in new york city so this wasn't on campus anymore this part but daniel anyway just moved out he moved ended up going back to campus living on his own on campus and just kind of ignored then larry would call and try to like reach him he would like stop answering his calls and his emails and then eventually just got out um but then the other people that were also kicked out they were drawn back in eventually um so the list of victims wasn't just restricted to that small group of students who were living there when Larry first moved in because at some point Santos which was one of the other students he was one he was suffering with depression at the time he introduced Larry to his two older sisters Felicia and Yalitza they were both in college at the time Yalitza was an undergrad at Columbia University and Felicia was a Harvard and Columbia graduate with a medical degree Felicia was doing a medical residency in LA at the time that she was introduced to Larry and it all went downhill for them very quickly from there. It wasn't too long after after Felicia met Larry, she quit her residency, she moved across the country, moved in with Larry and eventually started a romantic relationship with him. So, this is like I'm not supposed to show you, these are like highly educated people, like a Harvard graduate with a medical degree doing a residency like, I think a lot of times people like look at victims of cults and like, well they're dumb they just, they were like gullible and naive and like not educated and didn't know so but these are harvard educated people and they're still falling victim man like it's one thing to have this guy living in your dorm room so yeah you're gonna listen to him he's right there it's another thing to like drop your life and fly across the country for this guy like that's totally different and so crazy that he had that kind of power over somebody someone that was like smart and didn't need him you know (laughs) Yeah, like, she was totally, like, better off, obviously, without him. She had she had her shit together. Like, she was, go, had, like, going through a residency, and she quits that. She moves in with him, starts a romantic relationship with him. 
Um, and then other various acts of abuse, like Larry would put Santos into chokeholds until he would pass out on numerous occasions. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. So that's why I'm not going to go into all of it. But yes, it goes on and on. Um, I'm always so curious, like what these people say to the people that they get to do these kind of things like i just want to hear their speech i want to hear like what they do to recruit people just to like get into the mind of the people that fall for it because i just can't imagine what somebody would say to me and i'd be like yeah okay i'm coming across country for that like what i know exactly it's crazy and like i said too a lot of times people shame the victims and say well they're just like dumb like who would fall for that but i think it says more about i remember we did that we appeared on that other podcast we talked about cults i said like it's more of a testament to how good at manipulating the person is versus a testament to how stupid the victim is you know what i mean mm, yeah definitely like they're they're able to get these like super educated people who are smart to give up their whole entire life and like yeah you said i want to hear the way they t- the way he talks like i want to know like like it's just crazy to me I know, it's easy for us on the outside to be like, oh my god, like, how did you, why did you do that? How did you not see that? But I guess if it's happening to you in real life, you have no, like, outside perspective at all, it would be a lot easier, I guess, to think that you're a part of something better than it is. Yeah, it's super crazy. And obviously, like, she wouldn't have moved across country to live with him if she didn't believe what he was saying. So, like, obviously she was bought into it. So whatever he said was, worked. Um... See, like I said, so Lee Chen, he was the one who owned the um, apartment that they were living in in Manhattan. And he was the one who kind of said all of these like various acts of abuse, both chokehold and all that stuff. So he eventually came forward about all of that as well. He eventually ended up kicking Larry and some of the women out of his apartment eventually because he was just had had enough as well. Um, another piece to this case is the fact that Larry started to extort money from these students. He would have them create itemized lists of various pieces of property that they had destroyed in the apartment. So he would say like, oh, you scratched my pan. You need to pay me. You need to replace it. Or you broke my oven. You need to do that. Oh, you scratched my pan. Like, oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The scratch, this literally in the thing, it says scratch his pan. Like, he, like, beats Daniel up in the book because he scratched his pan, apparently. And broke his oven, allegedly, and he had to, like, pay for it. So, um you broke my fridge yeah (laughs) over the years these items amounted to hundreds of thousands of dollars that he requested that they pay back to him so in fact santos reportedly sent an email to larry at one point titled prices of your things i damaged slash ruined with preliminary total and the total was forty seven thousand dollars that he was required to pay back to larry and of course santos didn't have that kind of money so he relied on his parents to pay for it and he basically went to his parents and threatened to commit suicide if his parents didn't pay this amount so it just like it's crazier and crazier like, and crazier what the hell? wait was this like, like a just... legal thing that he had that larry was got like legally he had to pay this money back to me no it was just like he made them come up with a list and i guess it was in his eyes it was legal like he made them write the email so he santos wrote an email to larry with a list of all the stuff that he allegedly broke with a total breaking down how much it was and it was ended up being forty seven thousand oh dollars and God. santos was like he went to his parents and was like i'm gonna kill myself if you don't pay this so like you have to pay it so his parents were obviously super alarmed and his parents showed up at the apartment and demanded to be like shown this alleged damage that was caused and they were just trying to get show me that scratch it. pan <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like it's yeah, and like they, obviously they're like super sketched out. They're like, "What's going on?" So they go and Larry refuses to let them into the home. Won't let them go any further, and like it's wild. So when all this is said and done, Santos's parents ended up paying over two hundred thousand dollars to Larry over three years, and in total, between all of his victims, he reportedly made over one million dollars from all of these people for this. So he's like making money off this as well, like. He's why making didn't they go bank. to the police? I don't understand why they didn't go to the police. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's like, crazy. I mean, they show, they show up at the door. He wouldn't let him in. And my next thing would be like, okay, I'm gonna go to the police. Like, I'm not gonna pay you all this money three years for three years and not do anything about it. That's just ridiculous. Yeah, it's crazy. So, like, it's, it's so fucked up. Um, yeah, like, so he's, he's he's making money off these students as well and he's just and like i don't know like at this point maybe his parents i'm sure santos's parents at this point is like no this gotta stop like getting them the fuck out of that house i don't know maybe that's kind of what got the ball rolling with some of the parents i don't know but again the article doesn't go into a ton of detail about that 
Um, and then also after this, Yulitsa, which was Santos' sister, she tried to commit suicide by commit by swallowing an entire bottle of Tylenol in 2013. Then Claudia tried to commit suicide in 2014. Both suicide attempts were unsuccessful. But when these suicide attempts happen, okay, <laughs> it gets weird. When these happen, Larry would go to the hospital and he wouldn't allow his their parents to see them unless he was in the room with them. He had total control over everything, so they couldn't even see their own child after they tried to commit suicide. And because they were all over 18, there was nothing legally that could be done at that point because in the eyes of the law, they were all consenting adults. So I guess if his parents, their parents did go to the police and they're like, well, they're an 18 year old, like they're over 18. Like if they want to be with this man, like you can't stop them basically. So that's where it's like kind of like that gray area. It's like, okay, but at what point is it like, you know, yeah, they're over 18, but like also there's, he's a criminal. So that was like kind of like, I think the wall that they were bumping into with that kind of stuff. He probably wanted to be in the room with them so he could control everything that was going on with his parents to make sure that they didn't say anything to their parents without him being there. Yeah, like Like, he was... That's just fucked up. It's crazy. And in a direct quote from this uh, New York article, so quote, According to family and friends, only Santos tried to take his own life before meeting Larry. Since then, Isabella... Yalitza and Claudia have all attempted suicide. Larry later estimated that their cumulative number of attempts at more than 12. So in the years that followed all of this, Daniel, um, Isabella, and Talia, they all graduated in 2013. Claudia graduated a semester late and Santos ended up dropping out, never graduating. Claudia reportedly owed so much money to Larry that she had no choice but to go into prostitution to pay the money back. So on the streets, her alias was a combination of Larry's daughter's names. Larry created websites which advertised Claudia's services for up to $8,000 a night. This was also that she could pay him back for all of this alleged damage that she caused. So, um, like I said, the list of his offenses and horrible treatment goes on and on and on and on. Um, I've only scratched the surface, much like the scratch the surface of that pan. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, but I only scratched the surface, so I definitely recommend you read the full article for all the details. But if you're wondering, Sarah Lawrence College did have a statement after, like, that article came out, and they basically said that there was never any evidence that Larry Ray ever lived on campus. They couldn't really do anything. It's not like he signed a lease or asked anybody. No, and that's because they didn't have a proper, proper, like, no visitor rule or no squatting rules. Yeah. Well, they probably did, but not like someone's going around and checking, right? Yeah, clearly not. You think a private college, though, you would have those type of securities in, in place no well when i lived on campus nobody came around is anybody living here it's not supposed to like that never yeah happened. never happens you would just assume that it's not, no, happening. But it's not that's not a private no but obviously private. they didn't obviously they didn't no yeah i guess like clearly this went on for years so it didn't happen yeah and claudia's parents say that they did meet with the dean of the school alan green when they first heard that larry was living with the students and he basically said, there's nothing they can do because we cannot prevent a father from visiting his daughter. So that was kind of his response. Um, after this full-length article was published, authorities finally started to pay attention to the horrific situation that was going on. By this time, it's 2019, and this has been going on for nine years. So Larry was eventually indicted on federal charges in February 2020 and was arrested in one of his homes. We actually owned a bunch of homes. I think he was in his North Carolina home at the time of the arrest. He was arrested in one of his homes where he was living with two women believed to be Isabella and Felicia. He is being charged with sex trafficking, extortion, and forced labor conspiracy. And that was in February 2020, so um, it's only, what, like a year and a half now, almost two years ago. Um, And since then, in a new development, Isabella Pollock, she was once considered one of Larry's victims, so she's actually been charged as a co-conspirator for her role in all of this. So allegedly, she was actually way more involved as the years went on than everyone was originally led to believe. The New York Times reports that she may have been involved in Claudia being forced into prostitution. So Isabella is the only one other than Larry who has been charged with any of this. So was she getting money too? Like, did they probably have proof that she was getting, like you know earning money from yeah like whatever. she was kind of in on it with with like getting money from these from these students for these items that they broke it like she was getting some of that money as well like she was kind of in on it and she was the one who was getting a lot of the money from claudia being in prostitution so she was getting talia that. was never arrested yeah see i don't i don't know like all it says like talia graduated in 2013 but then that's like kind of the end of what it says about talia so i don't know like what if she 
got out. She has no con- contact because she seems like it'd be the obviously she was the one who has been in it since mm. she was a child. Like she was under his spell, so you'd think she would be the one. And it doesn't name in the article. Does says he says that he was living with two women at the time he was arrested. Um, I believe it's kind of speculated that it's Isabella and Felicia are those two because they are they're two of his most um, loyal supporters at the time. I feel like by that time, mostly everyone else had gone out um, or weren't obviously weren't as in they weren't living with him. Um, but now behind bars awaiting trial for which he could spend the rest of his life in prison if he's found guilty. Larry still has control over some of his victims. So while he's in jail, he's allegedly using his own father to communicate with some of his victims to try and scare them out of testifying as witnesses in the trial. Some reports say that this could be considered witness tampering. And at the time of Larry's arraignment on the original charges, Isabella and Felicia were in attendance at the court to support him. So obviously they were clearly sticking by his side. But now that was right after he was arrested. That was in 2020. And that was obviously before Isabella herself was charged in early 2021. So she was actually, the article came out March 1st, 2021, that Isabella was now charged. So they're the only two that have ever been charged with anything. Um, But so he's still awaiting trial currently. And yeah. (laughs) What do you guys think? Well, it's kind of of like the Nexium cult that happen too like it's kind of like it was kind of on the same same lines but not as i mean it's more gruesome than the nexium crime nexium cult but i feel like it's they're kind of similar because he has control over like what they do and where they go and how they like what they how they feel about themselves just like the nexium cult where he had control over everything they did just i find i don't know i find cult so fascinating to me i know it's Crazy, and I think too. A lot of times, like obviously, he probably was telling like all these students throughout that he knew all these people in the NYPD, and like he was high up in the CIA. So like obviously, they're going to be scared shitless to go against, you know. And that maybe that's why the parents also didn't. And also too, like they might think like, oh, he has people, he knows people up in the NYPD. Like, why am I going to go to the police? Like, the police know him. He's friends with them. Can't go to the FBI. They're friends with him. Like that's what might be what they think because he's told them all these stories about like how he has all these connections. So it's like, how do you go to the authorities when he's friends with the authorities, you know? Or at least claims to be. That's true. But, I mean, like I said before, it's like not that old. Like, this is pretty recent. So I don't know. I feel like it's easier to find out that kind of information. Maybe, I guess, if you're working with the FBI, that's not really out there on the internet. Like, secret agents and stuff like that. But I don't know. I'm not blaming anyone, but it's just... You know, back in like the seventies, it's easy easier for someone to say shit. And you not be able to back it up with anything, but now it's like you should be able to find that kind of information out. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. So the fact, like, I wouldn't just buy that if someone's like, "Oh, your," it's like, "Oh, your daughter's in a cult with this man who claims to be in the FBI." It's like, okay, well, maybe check into that, or like maybe follow up. I don't know. It just seems weird, and maybe the parents, I'm sure they were involved a little bit more in like trying to get them out, but. Um, obviously, it took them a long time to um, to obviously make any progress. It wasn't until that report, that article came out in 2019, that outlined all of this stuff that anything really happened. And it's crazy though to think that, like, even when you look up this case, like, you're not going to find a ton of information on it. Like, you might find a few YouTube videos, or you know, obviously that major article and a couple of like New York Times articles. But like, I feel like a case like this, like, how is it not more like all over the news? Yeah, that's true. And I guess, like, the parents probably just didn't realize, like, the severity of it as it was happening. Because I'm sure their kids weren't telling them what was happening. So it probably took them just a long time to clue in. And then by that time, it was, like, so out of their hands. All they could really do was pay, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, and it's crazy. And it's hard to say, like, how would the parents not know? It's, like, hard to, like, blame the parents. Because, obviously, like, they're not choosing to have their children, like, go through this. But, like... Obviously, the only person to blame here is Larry himself. But also, too, it's, like, a little bit weird. Is like, where is that line drawn? Because it's, like... Well, Isabella, I, I read a follow-up article from the New York Times. Or I think it was People like, People Magazine, actually, that said that her, Isabella's family is saying that, she, you know, she was a victim. So, like, she can't be charged because she was only doing those things because she was brainwashed by him. So, like, really, she's also a victim and shouldn't be charged. So it is kind of, like, that gray, gray area of, like well, what is the line? Like, I don't know. It's the same thing with the Nexium case, too. Like, 
when like Allison Mack was also charged with helping that Keith Raniere like with all that stuff it's like but she was also a victim of him so it's like how do you determine what actions were done as a victim and what actions were done by being involved I don't know it's crazy yeah and I think like those lines are blurred because you can be a victim but you're thinking what you're doing is helping and is good so it's like you even though you know what's happening you think your mind's so warped that you think it's a good thing like with the branding right like they they went out to be like yeah like that just shows that you're a part of this special and they I feel like they actually believe that it was a good thing for them to be branding you know these women even though obviously it's not but that's just where it's like they're so brainwashed that they they're doing these things i don't know it, it's it's like a blurred line and also i don't think i yeah that's true it's like it is really hard to determine what that line is and i don't know how they're gonna do that like especially in isabella's trial like how they're gonna determine like where that line where she crossed over the line of being a victim to being a co-conspirator but also i did forgot to mention both get both <clears throat> both larry and isabella both uh pleaded not guilty to the charges so that's currently where it stands and it's still ongoing, so I'm sure there'll be updates that come up. But yeah, I definitely encourage you to read that article and get Daniel's book. Um, we'll put a link to both of those because if you are fascinated by this case as much as I am and how crazy it is, like if you want more information, those are your two best sources. Cults are so interesting. Just like I can't, like I can't wrap my head around just like the psychology of the people that are involved. I know it's so crazy and I think it kind of goes to show that anyone can fall victim to it it's like I feel like a lot of people think it's only like the you know uneducated or like the people who are easy victims or it's like no I mean maybe there are some people that are more susceptible to it but like in the case of those you know those two women like who were like Harvard graduates who were like these are smart people so it can't it's not as simple as just saying it's like oh someone who's like uneducated or like you know has nowhere else to go they have nothing else going for them so they're just going to go into this like no it's a lot more complex than that yep it really is crazy i look forward to seeing if they actually get convicted and what their um what their sentences are going to be yeah and i wonder if anyone else will be charged like any of the other students who like may have done stuff or something like if more stuff will come out i don't know but yeah and i'll say all of this is alleged alleged because it hasn't been proven in court yet so i will just throw that out there oh yeah but alleged it's and all also, this stuff is alleged yeah and that book was written from daniel's point of view so he might not have known some of the other stuff that other people were doing allegedly so i mean yeah other stuff could come out yeah, that's why it's like, cause obviously, like I said at the beginning, like when I read like the synopsis of the book, that's what drew me into the case. But actually, like you learn more about what actually happened in the case from the article versus the book, because like I said, the book is all from Daniel's perspective. So it's like his thoughts. And so all of that other stuff about like Isabella and like all the suicide attempts from other people, like only stuff that he knows is in the book or he experienced. So he didn't know a lot of that stuff. So it doesn't go into as much detail about like obviously the backstory of Larry or any of that, but it's still an interesting read. It's crazy how, like, there's not, like, um, like, I read, I kind of read part of that article that you were talking about, like, a while back, but, like, I haven't heard any, like, I haven't heard any news on it at all. And I know, like for, it's weird. For, for a cult that's so fucked up as this one, I feel like that was something that the media would be all over. But a part of me wonders too. I'm like, when you think about, yeah, the media would be all over. You know, you think of like, you know, like we mentioned before, the Gabby Petito case. Like that case is crazy, but it's all over the news. Like this one is has so many layers, and it's so like this has like true crime documentary written all over it. But I'm thinking like, maybe it's possible. Like Larry has connections in the FBI, the NYPD. Like maybe they're not. They're keeping it hush hush. I don't know. Like who knows? Maybe they don't want it to come out, and maybe they're trying. Who knows what's gonna come out? Maybe. I, that's just a theory obviously i have nothing to back that up but like if he does have those powerful politicians who are like he does know them it's like who knows what they're doing behind the scenes to like make sure this story doesn't make it big i don't know again alleged we'll we'll update you as we know more about what happens um so stay tuned for that if there's any we'll of course let you know but as always you can follow us on instagram at crime family podcast on twitter crime family pod one we're also on Facebook at Crime Family Podcast, um, and we do have a Gmail account, so you can 
email us all of your case suggestions. We actually did get quite a few case suggestions um, just recently, so we're looking into those. Um, feedback, tips, or anything you want to say, let us know um, in our email. So that's crimefamilypodcast at gmail.com. So, yeah, until next time, we'll see you later. Peace out. <laughs> Bye. See ya.